Thank you, Hannah and team. And good morning. Glad you're here today. I want to start off uh, this portion of our service in a, in a time of, of prayer for some people that are in great need of our prayers. Uh, as you've been watching the news, I'm sure you're aware of those that are in northern Iraq who are uh, believers in Jesus, who are uh, under great persecution and uh, potential loss of life. Many of them have lost their lives because of the militant um, Islamic group ISIS. And uh, so our military has gotten involved with trying to protect these people, um, as well as giving humanitarian aid. Other countries are starting to get involved with that as well. But here are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We might speak a different language, might be halfway across the world, but we're one together. And uh, we want to pray for them, for God's protection of them, and that they would somehow know that people here and around the world are praying for them uh, this weekend. So let's, let's bow in a word of prayer. Lord, we know that evil and good both exist, and Lord, we know that there are those that are followers of you who have been asked to convert to Islam, and when they have said no, they've been killed. And Lord, we ask your protection of, of this group of people that's in great uh, danger right now. We ask that you would watch over them and that you would thwart the enemy. Lord, we ask that you would give them the food and the water that they need right now. And Lord, I pray that most of all, you would give them hope today and that somehow you would communicate to them as they feel maybe totally isolated that there literally are, are people all over the world partnering with them through prayer, lifting them up, Lord, and may they feel your presence like never before knowing that we're praying for them and others are as well. So Lord, we pray your protection and your help. Lord, thank you for this new day that you've given to us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here in this, your house. May we use this time, Lord, to, to encounter you and to learn from you and to be open to what you'd have us to do with it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue to go verse by verse through this incredible book of Acts, and we are learning about the early church and the start of this church and the explosion of growth in this church that is taking place, which begins now to cause some problems. Uh, one of the things that we've learned at Mission Hills is that explosive growth can cause problems. Um, and uh, it was almost four years ago, and a few weeks will be four years ago, when we moved into this building. and. And we've had explosive growth since then. And so this message, quite honestly, is for me. And if you want to listen in, you're welcome to. Um, but it's a very timely for me and very important for, for me. And I think for us as a whole church and for us as individuals as well. Um, one of the, the, the sentences that I have heard, I don't know how many times in the last four years, talking about issues of our growth, is this line, well, that's a good problem to have. Certainly, these have been good problems to have, um, but the word problem is always in that sentence. And uh, I just want to walk you through just some of the challenges that we've had in these last few years. Uh, challenges, uh, well, let me start off with just, uh, when we started here four years ago in this building, we started with two services on Sunday morning. And week number two, we had a guest preacher come in from the East Coast. His name is John Jenkins. John's a friend of mine, and he pastors in the D.C. area, this huge church there, over 10,000. And he came and spoke. And afterwards, he said to me, Mike, this place is going to explode with growth. You need to start a third service, like, right away. And he saw things that I didn't even see. And sure enough, not long after that, we started a third service, and then eventually a fourth service, and then a fifth service, two on Saturday, you know, three on, on Sunday. We begin uh, adding staff. We begin to need a lot more volunteers and adding more volunteers. Uh, when we moved in here, the parking lot that you see now wasn't even to what size it is now, and it's not adequate now. But uh, we immediately got into building uh, more of a parking lot because it wasn't big enough. And then not long after that, we begin to have problems in our children's area. Our, our kids' wing uh, was packed to overflowing, and we literally were shutting doors and saying, no more kids can come in. Can you imagine you know, that? Maybe you experienced that here. And so we quickly added um, six million more dollars into this building of building two different buildings for our children's wing, adding on to that. 
Um, we saw care needs beginning to slip through the cracks, people who needed care, but there's so many people who needed care, we didn't have the resources or the people or the staff to do that. So we beefed up that area through Pastor Rick Derbyshire, Pastor Josh Weidman, and, and counseling and pastoral care and all of that, uh, Pastor Jerry Jones, all of those people involved with that. Um, we, we, we began uh, a f- one Saturday night service, and then that got really full, and so we, then we added a second Saturday night service. Um, and it, you know, it's changed our lives in many ways, especially on staff. And let me just kind of take a, a little a side note on Saturday night because we made a decision recently about a change there that we're communicating this weekend. And um, what's happened is um, we were told this in advance by some people that know large churches and, and fast growth in churches. And we were told that when you go from three services to four services, it'll really you know, s- stress you. When you go from four services to five services, it'll kill you. (laughs) Isn't that nice? Um, But we went ahead anyway, and they were right. They were right. I'm just, you know, so as elders, we made a decision um, a little over a week ago that we are going to go back to having one Saturday night service and not do two. Uh, Because it's it's too much for, for us as a staff, for all the volunteers we need to get. Um, I've suffered through some early stages of burnout and I'm working through some of that. And uh, we just, there's something that happened from going from four to five that put us kind of over the, over the line. So we are going at the end of this month on uh, Labor Day weekend on the 30th of August back to one service on Saturday. It's going to be at five o'clock. That was the original time we had for service. People really liked five o'clock. We're going to do five o'clock. And, and then our youth ministries, that affects them because they meet on Saturday night. And the decision has been made that we're going to have junior high and high school here on Saturday nights at the same time, not meeting together, but at the same time, because the building is empty after the service is over, and uh, junior, uh, junior high will be in one area, high school in another area, and they'll meet at 6.30 to 9.30 at the same time, so as a parent, that's really nice. So you can go together as a family at 5, and then your kids stay for, for youth ministry after that, and then you come back and get them at 9.30. So that's going to be happening. And these are some of the issues and problems that come with a fast-growing church, changing, switching, trying to figure it all out. What can you handle? What can you not? Uh, Just a few other thoughts that go with that about about Saturday night and just going back to four services. One is when you only have one service on Saturday night, it's harder to get uh, volunteers to work in children's ministry, if you can imagine, because then you have to come back on Sunday to do a worship service if you're volunteering on Saturday. But we have a lot of kids who come on Saturday night, and so we need some of you to come and serve on Saturday night for children's ministry for that one hour, and then, you know, come back here on Sunday to worship. And our children's are, children's a high priority, but we're really struggling with with getting enough people to help. And you don't have to be a teacher necessarily, but you can just help out in certain ways, but we really need that. So if you could be proactive and be a part of that. The other thing that we've decided, and we'll be moving forward with this in the fall, and we don't have all the dates of when we'll be moving forward with this, but we'll be getting back to you, is that, you know, we know on Saturday nights we're going to have some times where we're probably going to have overflow. And you know this service, you know, we're pretty packed, and next service is pretty packed. So we finally made the decision that instead of keep adding services, we're going to make this room bigger. Um, It was built to become bigger. Um, This back wall that we have here is not the same wall as you see out in the lobby. There's, There's room in between. And so um, it was designed to add 700 more seats in here. And so we will uh, do that. We'll blow out this back wall and add 700 more seats. So instead of 1,100 in here, there'll be 1,800 seats in here, which will help uh, a ton uh, with all of this. We'll be also expanding our lobby to make room for everybody. And so that's all coming in, in, the, in the fall, and we'll be telling you all about that. So these are some of the decisions that are constantly having to be made when it comes to, to growth. But our growth is slow and small compared to the church we're looking at here in Acts chapter 6. This church, in literally a matter of months, has exploded from zero to maybe fifteen to 20,000. I want you to take your Bibles and turn them to Acts chapter 6, New Testament, five books in, page 914 on the Bibles we have provided here. If you don't own a Bible, take that Bible, we want you to have it. But we see, as we get to this point in the story of this early church, a lot of growth. In chapter 2, 
We see that after the very first sermon that Peter gives on the day of Pentecost, there's 3,000. We see just a few verses later, there's even more growth. We get to chapter 4, and it says that there's 5,000 just men now. So you add women and children to that. And then there's other points getting to chapter 6, where it talks about the growth and the multiplication of it expanding greatly. So is it 15,000? Is it 20,000? Don't know for sure. But it's become overnight a huge church in Jerusalem, and Things are now starting to, to show that. The, the, the care in particular of people is, is beginning to become a problem as there's 12 apostles and there's this massive amount of people that need to be ministered to. So it creates some unique problems. And, and the early church challenges are basically caring for people individually and role adjustment for the leaders. And we're going to see some key leadership principles today with, with what happens here. But one of the key leadership principles is this, is to keep first things first. To keep first things first. And that's what we're going to see that the apostles do with their leadership. And it's really helpful to see that. And so let's look at chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, um, the disciples, not meaning the 12 disciples, but the followers of Jesus, as they were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution, meaning the daily distribution of, of food to care for them. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, it could be also sisters, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. A proselyte was a Gentile who converted to Judaism. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. Look at verse 1 again. It says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, so it's huge, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows are being neglected in the daily distribution. I, I smile when I read this verse because it's the first recorded complaint in the church. <laughs> and there's a, plenty more to come. Plenty more to come in the New Testament. Plenty more to come since in the last 2,000 years. Complaints in the church. Um, it's just part of being a part of the church. People ask me, how do you deal with complaints? I'm saying, you know what, I get it. I get complaints. I, I can't even please myself, let alone please everybody else. So I understand complaints. I, I have a pastor friend who has in his office, um, it's, a, it's a big frame, and in it is not a picture, but it's three cards. They're comment cards from the exact same Sunday morning worship service on a particular day. The first card says something to the effect of... Um, Music, way too loud, turn it down. Middle card says, music's never been better, keep it as it is, thank you. Third one, music too soft, would you please crank it up? <laughs> Same service, and he put them um, on this, you know, in this frame and put it on his wall to remind him that you're never going to please everybody. So I, I thought that was pretty funny, personally. But anyway, the stated problem here is that the Hellenist widows are being neglected of being taken care of. That certainly is a legitimate problem. The bigger issue here is a church that is growing so fast that the apostles cannot handle all the needs. There are 12 of them, and there's now you know massive amount of people. Now, a Hellenist is a Greek-speaking Jew. And they became Greek-speaking instead of Hebrew or Aramaic-speaking because... A number of the Jews had been dispersed due to persecution, due to conquerings, things like that over a period of time. So they left Israel and went to another area of the local world there that spoke Greek. So they learned Greek and that became their language. They began to take on some of the characteristics of the culture. And then some of them have now moved back to Israel, but they're not accepted in the same way as those who stayed. They're seen as tainted. They don't have the, you know, the language of Hebrew and Aramaic. They, they are tainted because now they're taking on some of the cultural norms of the Greek culture. And so they're seen as secondary or second class. It's kind of a, a form of racism within a race. 
And, and what takes place here now is, is the Hellenists saying, hey, wait a minute. The, the widows that are from, you know, from here and are the Hebrew widows, if you will, are taken care of, but our widows aren't being taken care of. There's favoritism going in here, and something needs to be done about this. Now, when you read the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, one of the things you cannot miss is that God has a soft spot in his heart for widows. I mean, still that's the case, no doubt. But in that day, there was no life insurance policies. There, 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 was, there was really almost no care for a, a widow from her husband when he would pass away. And so she was in dire straits. And God had a, a, it just has a soft spot for widows then, for widows now. And we see that, like in the New Testament in James chapter 1, verse 27. James writes, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I mean, I think if you were to stop that and say, what is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God? Uh, what would it be? You probably wouldn't have said the very first thing, well, to visit orphans and widows in their time of need. But that's the heart of God. In the Old Testament, you find actually commandments in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 24 and in chapter 26 to the farmers that they were not to harvest the corners of their crops to leave some of that food for the widows to come and to be able to, to take from there so that they would be able to be fed. It was a system to take care of the widows by not taking all of the food from the crops. This also applies to the orphan and to the sojourner or the immigrant that would come. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, we find quite a lengthy section in that chapter of, of specifics on, on how to take care of the widows and who are truly are the widows that the church should take care of and who should they not. I mean, this is part of the heart of God that he cares about the, the widow. So the complaint that comes to the apostles is a legitimate, it's a legitimate complaint. And we know that because they get right to work on solving this problem. They don't skirt it. On my desk, I have a quote that says, uh, so... What are you going to do about it? I put that on there because leaders are handed problems on a regular basis, and you can choose not to do anything about it, which has never proven to be a very good method, or you can do something about it. It's part of leadership, and they get right to it, and we're going to learn about some great principles of leadership here by how they handle this. First of all, they address the problem head on. They address the problem head on. Look at verse 2 again at the beginning there. The 12 summon the full number of the disciples. They get, they get the entire church together. I mean, why? I mean, there's, there's so many of them. Why get them all together? Why not just get a committee to figure this thing out? Well, it doesn't say why, but I'm going to take some, some guesses as, as to why. That they, they want to deal with the issue because there's disunity for the first time. I mean, it wasn't that far before this that we saw incredible unity and generosity toward one another. But for the first time, there's disunity. And they want to address this because this is serious. We find throughout the teachings of the New Testament the concern of disunity in the church and how unity is a high priority for God. And so they get everybody together and say, we need to talk about this. We need to have unity here. On top of that, they want to explain their role as an apostle. And we'll look at that in just a little bit. That their role is not to take care of these widows, not that they don't care, but that's not their role. And then thirdly, I think the reason they get everybody together is because they want to give them a solution and have them come up with a solution. Secondly, they place the right people in the right places. They place the right people in the right places, which is always important to do as a leader. Verse 2, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Look at verse 5. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, men full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So they choose these seven, seven individuals. They don't push uh, this on to novices. No, they go and choose the best of the, of the best. They had uh, great requirements. Uh, they need to have a good reputation, which means they need, they're trusted by the people. They need to be full of the Holy Spirit, which means they are spiritually sound and effective. Third, they need to be full of wisdom. They need to make good choices and godly decisions. They're full of wisdom. I mean, this is a good short list of spiritual leadership. Someone who is trusted, godly, and wise. 
And that's the kind of uh, individuals that they select here. They appoint these seven men, five of them, that this is the only time they're ever mentioned in the Bible. Two of them we know more about. Those are the first two, Stephen, who we're going to learn a lot more about in the rest of chapter 6 and all of chapter 7. And then Philip, who is a key part of a story in chapter 8, and then a slight mention of him in chapter 21. The other uh, five we never hear about again. But get this, all seven of these, of these names are Greek names. They're Greek names. So they were appointed, and they are themselves Hellenists, it appears. So they're going to care more than anybody about the Hellenist widows because they are Greeks themselves in their, in their background. So God puts this on their hearts. Also notice this, that the apostles didn't themselves pick these guys. They set up the parameters. They set up, here's the kind of guys you should get. This is the amount of people that you should get. Now you go and find them. It doesn't say how they did that and how they did that with you know, tons of thousands of people. I don't know. They must have somehow got a committee together of some sort to get this. But they let the people figure out how to work this out so that they're not focused on doing all of this themselves. And they end up laying hands on these men and praying and commissioning prayer on them that we see in verse 6. Thirdly, <clears throat> these apostles clarify their priorities as leaders. They clarify to the people their priority, priorities as leaders. Look at verse 2 again. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. And verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's what they're about. I mentioned last weekend that that Daniel Henderson had his national prayer uh, uh, conference here, and we hosted it, and it was a great uh, few days. And um, Daniel's ministry is called the 6-4 Fellowship, taken from Acts chapter 6, verse 4. Encouraging pastors to be about the main priorities that the apostles were about, the ministry of the Word of God through preaching and the ministry of prayer. The apostles are not in any way above helping out these, these widows. That's not what's going on here. They're not saying, you know what, we're too important to take care of these, these widows. We're too important to serve food to people. That's not what's going on here. But they have a certain calling and a certain priority that God has put them on, and other people can take care of, of, of this issue. But their calling is a different calling. There are times when we, uh, as staff members, get criticized uh, here from different people because staff are not at certain events that go on. You know, some staff don't come or a lot of staff aren't there or I'm not there. But one of the things I tell our staff is this, don't worry about those criticisms because you've been called here and, and, and gifted here for your area of ministry. Pour yourself into that, which is plenty to do. If you can attend other things, that's fine. You don't have to. There's no requirement there because you've been called to a certain area of this, of this ministry. And that's what's going on here is that they're saying, you know what, these are good things, they're important things, we're going to address them, we're going to get help here, but we're going to be focused on the preaching of God's word and on, on prayer. That's the role of the apostle, and to not do a bunch of other things. I've told this story uh, before, but it fits very well with, with this um, passage, and it was really a defining moment for me. Jane and I were at a pastor and wife's conference uh, this is about six years ago, I think it was, because it was right before we were getting ready to do all the plans for this building. And we went to this conference, and it was the night before it ended. It was going to end the next day around noon. And we decided, you know, instead of going out for breakfast at a restaurant the next morning, we'd just like to get some food and have it in the room. So in the morning, we could just eat breakfast in the room and then go down to the last meetings. And so we got in our car, we left the hotel, we went on this busy street that we thought there's certainly going to be a supermarket somewhere along the, the line here pretty soon, and there wasn't. Uh, we drove quite a long ways till we ever found one, but it gave us a chance to talk, and Jane then asked me a question. Now, I don't know, men, if you've ever had this, if you're married, but it was one of those questions that, you know, you're asked it, but you know that she already knows the answer, and you're supposed to come up with the right answer. Am, am I the only one? <laughs> So um, she asked me the question, so why do you think God uh, brought you to this conference? <laughs> hmm. I asked 
you know, I thought about it. I said, well, you know what? Um, it's been a good conference. I've, I've liked it, but I can't really come up with a very specific thing. And then Jane told me why God brought us to this conference. <laughs> And I don't know, guys, but every once in a while, your wife sounds like the Holy Spirit. You ever notice that? And because and sometimes she is. She is God's voice into your life. And this certainly was the case on this particular occasion and many other occasions, as she's sitting right here. Many occasions. <laughs> <laughs> she just got some pillows, cases. Actually, my sister gave them to him, but <laughs> I'm not going to mention this in the service. <laughs> So we have two chairs in our bedroom, and now one says Mr. Wright, which is my, my side, and then hers is Mrs. Always Wright. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> you just inspired me by sitting there and telling this. I know her coffee. She just told me. Okay. So anyway, she says to me, as we're getting ready to come back and come into this huge building program, $29 million building program, all this, the, the decisions are going to be made are going to be by the hundreds, if not thousands of decisions. She says... I think that you should give the building project over to some of your staff and to other people in the church who are going to do this. She said, because our church does best, Mission Hills does best, when you are about your being, your inner life with the Lord, and preaching. When you're focused on those two things, we do best as a church. And I thought, that's the voice of God. Came back, and I was a little nervous about sharing that with some of the key staff and others who were going to be doing all the work, saying, here you go. But I told them about our, our conversation. I said, I really think that that's the voice of God through Jane, and I'm handing this to you. Come to me when you need me, but, but here you go. And here's the response that I got from them. I learned something very important about leadership at that moment because they, they were very respectful, but here's what I know that they really said to me in their own way. Thank you. <laughs> We're better at this than you are. You're better at that than we are. You do your thing, let us do our thing, and we're actually kind of glad you're not going to be there. I'm not positive, but I think I went to four meetings of hundreds of meetings. And they would you know, keep me informed. But literally, while they were building this uh, facility, we'd be walking around and I'd be asking, so what's this and what's that? They did a good job without me. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great lesson for me through my wife, through the Lord. The, the priorities of, of what the apostles have is their priorities. I see not, not that a senior pastor is an apostle, but the role is very similar to what an apostle has, to be focused on, on preaching the word of God and on prayer. Notice that the list that they give is not strategic planning or vision casting or hospital visitation or counseling or fundraising or youth ministry or small groups or staff oversight. All those have their place and all of them have their importance, but their role was preaching and prayer. Church leaders are the shepherds of God's people, appointed by God to lead his people. Therefore, these leaders must be guided by God's word and dependent upon God's spirit because God's church must be guided by God's word and dependent upon God's spirit because God's people should be guided by God's word and dependent upon God's spirit. And everything else supports those priorities and not the other way around. These are the fundamentals. This is the blocking and tackling of what, of what ministry is about. And the apostles devoted themselves to these two priorities so let's talk about them briefly. I mean, we could talk for, for weeks on each of these priorities, but let's just do it briefly. First of all, preaching. Being guided by God's word, not by human word. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word is still alive. Even though we have all the technology and all the video capabilities and everything, there's still something about digging into God's word and to preaching his word that God uses to touch us on the deepest of levels. It's alive and active. It's relevant. I'm amazed. 2,000 years after some of this is written, three to 4,000 years after some of this is written, still relevant. 
able to penetrate and convict us in the deepest inner being, able to reveal the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. When I was a teenager, I, I liked to hang out in some verses in Psalm 119 because it said, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. And the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This is about his word, not about the preacher's word. If you're going to a place that it's all about what the guy has to say, but not about what God has to say, don't go there. Preaching is about being guided by God's word. And secondly, prayer is dependent upon God's spirit. It's dependent upon God's spirit. In Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, it says that God's house is to be a house of prayer. And then Jesus comes into God's house with his disciples, and he sees that it's not a house of prayer. He sees it's a house of selling and buying and personal gain, and he gets really upset. In Mark chapter 11, it says, And they, Jesus and the disciples, came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And as he was teaching them and saying to them, it is, is it not written, my house shall be called a, a house of prayer for all the nations. Talking about Isaiah 56, 7. But you have made it a den of robbers. God said that the church, his house, was to be first and foremost a house of prayer. Why? Because the church is God's house. This place was built to encounter him, to experience a relationship with him, to enjoy him, to love him, to worship him, to depend upon him and to hear from him. Prayer is about, uh, about a relationship and it's about dependence, a relationship with a, a, almighty God, a personal relationship with him that you can have with him and dependence upon him and his spirit. And that turns into a relationship of dependence. It's not about a grocery list. Can I get everything I want from him? I got my list and I want this done, this done, this done. Heal me. Uh, give me more money. Help me have the right relationship. I want this done, that done. And make it all good and easy for me. It's, it's about a relationship with Almighty God that he's provided for us. That we can have a conversation with him. And it's about dependence upon him on a daily basis. So we've made prayer a much higher priority in the last few years. And Pastor Daniel Henderson coming has really helped with that. We have, amen, we, we have, uh, in every service, we call it powerhouse, in the prayer room right back here, we have people praying during every service, for the, during the whole service, praying that God would work in, in, a, in a mighty way. You can always join them during the services. We have, after each service, as you're aware of, people from our prayer team that come up and offer a place for you to come and, and to pray in a confidential way. Sometimes you just need somebody to come alongside you. You get lonely in the battle or you need some encouragement to, to just come up and be prayed for. is always a wonderful thing. During our week, we have a lot of prayer that goes on Monday morning, 6.30. We have a group of men that come here and pray. Men, you're welcome to come Monday mornings at 6.30. We, we have on, on Monday also all the prayer cards that come in. We have a group of people that pray for, for the prayer request that, that, that you give. On, on Tuesday morning, right here in this section, we have a group, uh, our elders come. They come before work, 6.30 in the morning. Tuesday mornings, they come here and they pray. They pray for you. They pray for our services. They pray for the movement of God and whatever else. On, on Wednesdays, in a room right behind this wall here, our staff meet and we have a staff chapel and a good portion of that is prayer. And we make that a high priority to pray for, for the things that are going on here in God's work. In our, in our small groups, in our life groups, in our Sunday school classes, in our men and women's Bible studies, we have times of prayer. Um, Epicenter is a, is a group gathering that we've had in the past where we invite everybody to come in the evening to pray. And we're going to be doing that on a quarterly basis on Wednesday nights now to make it a night where a lot more people are naturally here. And the first one's going to be in September. And uh, we'll let you know about, about that coming up. But to come and to pray together as, as a group. We're going to have uh, some prayer summits uh, one's going to be local or for, for one night and two days to get together and just to get away to pray. And then a more uh, larger, uh, longer one, I should say, for three days up in the mountains and two nights if you want to encounter prayer and God in, in an amazing way. 
It has to be a priority at the church because this is God's house. This is the priority of the apostles. It needs to be our priorities. It needs to be our priorities personally. God's word and prayer. We can do that wherever we are. God's word and prayer on a daily basis to encounter God through his word that guides us, leads us, convicts us, encourages us, and through prayer, a relationship of dependence with him every day. It's good for us individually. It's good for us as a church. These are our priorities. So how did this work out? You know, the apostles now are not involved with everything and got these new seven guys doing this other stuff. And how'd that work out? Look at verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Worked out pretty good. The result is a church that is spreading the gospel. The word of God continued to increase. The result is a church that is growing by conversion growth. The number of disciples multiplied greatly. The result is a church that is experiencing transformed lives. A great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Jewish priests, rabbi types, converting to Christianity. The movement of the Spirit is strong. And when a church's foundation and when a person's foundation is the Word of God and prayer, God works through those kind of priorities in a life and in a church. And my prayer is that we would exemplify that here at Mission Hills and that we would exemplify that in our own personal lives, in the Word of God, and through a relationship of dependence through prayer. So let's pray. Lord, these are the basic fundamentals, but we so often get scattered into other priorities, things that we think are so important but often they aren't. They certainly aren't the essentials. To carve out time to be in your word and to be in prayer. For us as a church to make that our utmost priority, not a bunch of other uh, programs or things that to be, to be the central theme, but the central theme is to be your word that guides us and directs us and empowers us and, and prayer of our relationship of dependence upon you. Lord, may these be our commitments. May we reflect what we see here in this, your early church. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.